I really do feel that us using HTTP to connect modern distributed systems where you have to have sidecars and proxies and load balancers and everything under the sun is just a madness. I cannot believe people keep doing it and go, yep, that's the way we should do it. I understand how we got here. I can't understand how we haven't got to a tipping point to go, hey, we don't have to do it like that anymore. Bandwidth for Changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode Cloud Servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. This episode is brought to you by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean's developer cloud makes it simple to launch in the cloud and scale up as you grow. They have an intuitive control panel, predictable pricing, team accounts, worldwide availability with a 99.99 uptime SLA and 24 7, 365 world class support to back that up. DigitalOcean makes it easy to deploy, scale, store, secure, and monitor your cloud environments. Head to do.co slash changelog to get started with a $100 credit. Again, do.co slash change log. Let's do it. It's go time. Welcome to Go Time, your source for diverse discussions from around the Go community. Fight your FOMO by following the Go Time FM handle on Twitter. You'll get notifications for the live show, clips and highlights from past episodes, links and repos for gophers, and the occasional trolling of those JS party dweebs. Next week on the show, we've got Denise Yu from GitHub. Right now, it's Derek Collison. Okay, here we go. Hello, and welcome back to Go Time. Those of you tuning in week after week to support us, thank you. And thanks to those of you joining us for the first time. Be sure to go back and listen to our previous episodes. Lots of goodies in there. Did you know you can listen to the show live as it's recorded every Tuesday, 3 p.m. Eastern? Yep, that's right. Head on over to gotime.fm for details. So shout out to our live listeners um, currently and on the GoTime channel on uh, Gopher Slack. Your participation surely makes for a better show. I'm Johnny Borsico and joining me today are John Calhoun, Matt Ryer, whom you come to know and hopefully love as regular hosts on the show. John, Matt, do you wish to be loved? It'd be nice. Yeah. Yeah. You still working on that, Matt? <laughs> Here's the key. You have kids and they'll love you unconditionally, at least for a little while. Um, mm. When they get older, I can't guarantee anything. <laughs> yeah, it is challenging as somebody who has a teenager and some little ones. I can definitely see the drift happening <laughs> really? in real time, in real time. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a surreal experience. Mm. So uh, our special guest today, um, not to be forgotten, is uh, Derek Collison. Glad to be here. Good stuff. So you are best known for your work on NATS, uh, a well-liked distributed messaging system written in Go. So uh, yeah, definitely good to have you here. Today's show, the topic for today's show is going to be the challenges of building distributed messaging systems. And we're hoping that you will be able to shed a lot of light on the topic for us. So before we start, I must say that when I was first getting into Go and, and really starting to sort of say, okay, you know what? Go seems like the next best thing for me, right, for my career, the next technology I should jump into, the next language I should learn. I, I went to the first GopherCon back in 2014, and yours was probably one, the first or second talk of, of GopherCon, and you blew me away with, with that talk, right, that you were sort of talking about Nats and, and sort of a, how Go was a good fit for these kinds of high-performance systems, and from then on, I was hooked. I was like, okay, this is this is like really cool stuff. You are showing all, all these sort of, sort of benchmarks and everything else. I'm like, okay, there there is a lot to this. There is a lot to the language itself, which the technology you were working on was uh, um, sort of a demonstrating, right? Because we know Nats, uh, and you'll probably get into that, was originally written in Ruby, and you switched to Go for a number of reasons, performance probably being one of the top ones. Uh, but basically, this showed, right, the, the sort of the power of the language and the kinds of things you could do with it. So why don't you introduce us to Nats, and then we'll get into sort of a, this is not a show purely about Nats, but it's certainly a vehicle for sort of a proving out some of the concepts and things you've learned. But why don't you introduce us to the concept of distributed messaging? Like, what is it? Why do you want it? Why should I, as a developer, right, um, care about it? Well, it's a, it's a great question. You know, I've been doing this now 
geez, over 25 years. And so my career started with you know being thrown into distributed systems by accident, right? So when I was coming out of university, uh, we were still in a scale up, not scale out. Scale out was uh, actually kind of a bad word. And it happened to be for me that my first job out of, of school was at the Applied Physics Lab of Johns Hopkins uh, University on the East Coast. Johnny, from where you are, and, and I was originally. And um, by happenstance, I got selected by the second best physicist at the lab, not the first. And the way it worked back then was the top physicists got almost all of the supercomputer time. And so I was working on advanced visualization for large data sets, and that's kind of was my passion in, in school. You know, my bosses kind of came to me and said, hey, we, we don't have a lot of supercomputer time, but we have these 12 spark pizza boxes, make those go as fast as the connection machine, you know, which is, I was like, what? And so I, you know, I, I go down this path of trying to wire these boxes together and figure out how they can coordinate and break the work up. And all of the things that I think, you know, a lot of listeners probably today take for granted, it's just the way we do things. But back then it was like, oh, really? You know, I just can't get the faster computer. Um, and then when I went to uh, California in, in late 91, um, I ran into the exact same problem with a healthcare startup. We had so many doctors wanting to watch the federal trial data that I was generating. It was crashing the server nonstop. And so I had to figure out how to scale that out, right? Because I couldn't, I had no budget to buy a faster machine. And the little uh, next step, uh, even with the 68040 chip, if anyone remembers those, just couldn't handle it. So eventually I, I think I got smart and said, oh, well, maybe I'm supposed to be doing something like this instead of the stuff I thought I was going to do. And so I joined a startup called Technicron Software Systems that became TIPCO, and they were trying to revolutionize the way um, finance was working in, in Wall Street. And specifically, it was around the notion that we had started to get to a point where the pattern was breaking down. And, and what I mean by that, and it's a very long answer to your short question, but is the way Wall Street was working back then before TIPCO came along was is that stock distribution, like I was going to update you on the stock of IBM, was like a, a telephone call. I would dial you up and tell you what it was, hang up, and I would go to the next person, dial them up. And you know when the number of, of updates was low and the number of people who cared was low, and by the way, this was people looking at terminals, not machines yet, it wasn't that big of a deal. But they already kind of got the sense of, uh-oh, this is going to be a problem when you know, Derek is the one last at the end of the line and it takes three seconds to update everyone. His data is now older than someone else. So whoever's at the front of the line has an advantage, right? And so the way we push, pitch this to Wall Street wasn't low level technology and unicast, multicast, pub, sub type stuff, but we simply said, we want to change the paradigm from a telephone call to a radio broadcast. Everyone just tunes in on the station and they all get the updates at the same time. And so, you know, PubSub was kind of born out of that kind of driving um, problem space, right? That opportunity. And uh, it's existed for a long, long time. And, you know, finance verticals, other verticals were very into it. Um, of course, then we had multicast and multicast was supposed to solve, you know, everyone's problems, but it didn't. And what's happening now is, is that people are starting to come back to the tech, but not not necessarily the the old ways of thinking about it, but to solve newer problems in modern distributed systems and, and cloud native stuff. So, you know, messaging is simply think of it as a connective technology to glue together, you know, distributed systems. There's lots of those today, right? You know, and you usually have things that are very specific. I'm talking to a database, MySQL or Postgres or Redis as a KV or an object store. And then there's some that are generic. What's interesting though is some are generic and they've actually kind of layered on top of point-to-point -point communication, which defeats the whole purpose, you know what I mean, of, of looking at a, a technology that allows multiple patterns. And so, you know, for me, most people are using the absolute wrong technology to connect the distributed systems. They're using one-to-one, point-to-point request reply. And they build a whole bunch of stuff around it to get around the fact that that's not a good pattern to use to build distributed systems. And so, Messaging systems start coming into, you know, the picture again. Um, NATS itself, I, I built it, could care less if anyone used it. It was solving a problem when I was architecting Cloud Foundry uh, at VMware, which is now, you know, pivotal, now back to VMware. You know, it was kind of a, a stab for me at trying to develop an enterprise platform as a service when Heroku and Google App Engine were kind of 
all of the rage. And I just been building systems like that for decades. And that's just how I build them with messaging systems. But I realize that most people don't, right? They're like HTTP or today they go gRPC or maybe you see Kafka or Pulsar type stuff. Um, I just build them always like that. And a lot of the systems I built in the late nineties are still running, you know, 25 years later, you know, in very mission critical situations. And so usually I don't get yelled at or kicked out of a room if I walk back in and it's still running there. But I realized that most people didn't care or want to worry about that. Scale out was still fairly new. It was just starting to take hold. But these days I think people are coming back to it on their own, right? They're saying, this just doesn't feel right. You know what I mean? So that, that's kind of where the history of why messaging systems, I think, popped up, how Nats came to be. But again, we, did, we never planned on anyone to ever use it, to be honest with you, when we first built it. <laughs> so it's a nice surprise that uh, now you're in, in, what, version two? It's gone GA a little while ago? Yeah, I think, I don't know how many releases we've done. Obviously, what you were talking about, Johnny, with GoPro, that was, by the way, that was great. I got to speak right behind Rob Pike, and they asked me specifically to not just point out the things that I liked, mm-hmm. to point out the things that, that I was struggling with. And so if you go back and, and look at that talk, it's um, me talking about a lot of the performance um, struggles that, that I had early on. But to be honest with you, it was one of the best bets we ever made. We started on it when it was 0.56. Mm-hmm. And it actually wasn't performance, believe it or not. The reason that I wanted to move away from Ruby, which is a language I still like, um, was deploying production systems with the dependency management Mm. piece had become so painful for for us trying to do Cloud Foundry and VM Force and later some other uh, initiatives that I said, I need something that does not do that. And so the only priorities I had were produces static binaries. And the fact that the biggest thing for me, believe it or not, again, very, very early on with Go was that it had real stacks, which means If you're a programmer and you kind of know what you're doing, you have the ability to relieve the pressure off the GC Mm because those GC was very, very primitive at the beginning, but it didn't matter. And I I saw it right away. I was like, I can use a stack for real. And work that I had done in TIPCO took me three months in C to figure out how to transparently transition from a stack to a heat pointer automatically. We got that for free and go, right? Stick it on the stack. If it outgrows it, you just auto promotes it. So that was the only two things that made my mind up, and, and the rest is history. Probably more familiarity with messaging systems in a call than perhaps uh, Matt or John. So I'm trying to leave a little bit of room for them to sort of jump in and ask questions. So to me, from a developer's standpoint, which you haven't jumped into yet, right? So we, we've gotten a use case of why you sort of uh, created, right, went down that road and created this, this, this technology, sort of this fan out approach, right? I say broadcast this and allow those that are interested to sort of pick up on that broadcast. That way everybody has the same sort of uh, um, timings, right, in terms of uh, what they get notified of and when. From a developer standpoint, I, I hear that. I'm, I'm like, okay, well, that's a way of decoupling. That's a way of basically saying, hey, like I don't have to have a, this component in my in my architecture and my system be so tightly bound to this other one that if something even happens to this other one, maybe it goes down or maybe you know it's it's running in an impaired state of some kind that I can I'm still in control of my own sort of you know, environment and destiny, if you will, right? So so how much does messaging or how much should messaging play a role? especially in this sort of service, nano service, all bunch of distributed, you know, pieces running everywhere. Like how much of a role do you think that should be playing yeah. when you're considering an architecture like this? No, I think that's a great question. And like I said, I took a stance for probably almost 20 years of, oh no, just use whatever you're going to use. You know, I, I really wouldn't even engage with people because it would be a two hour conversation. I would still probably lose uh, the argument at the end, uh, so to speak. What's happening now is is that things are kind of coming back to it. So just to to level set, right? One of the things I care deeply about with messaging systems is a couple things. And and it's not about messaging, especially not about your, you know, the message broker from the 90s type stuff. So uh, we need to not think of it like that. We need to think of it as a ubiquitous technology, kind of like network elements, right? So I was around when there was a single cable. And if you ever kicked the Terminator cap off the end, it took the whole network down, right? And I saw the birth of hubs and switches and smart switches and topper rack and, you know, all the crazy network elements that we have. And, you know, just as well, a modern system needs to be doing that that similarly. But to start out with, the first thing it does is it says, I am going to do addressing and discovery not based on an IP import, but on something else. 
you can call it a channel, a topic, a subject. I really don't care what you call it. Now, again, for a while, people were like, why? This doesn't make any sense. But in today's cloud native world, I would argue what everyone is doing today makes no sense. We struggled so hard to change servers from pet to cattle. And yet we're still saying, oh, I want to talk to Johnny's service. So I need to know the notion of an IP port. Now, I know what the audience is probably thinking, and I'll walk through an example of what this really looks like in practice. The other thing, too, is, is that messaging systems, when they do that abstraction, a lot of people call it PubSub. And we still call it PubSub, but again, we've gone away from that because it's it's kind of got a bad you know rep. But what I mean by PubSub is, is that it, the technology can understand uh, multiple messaging patterns, one-to-one, one-to-n, m-to-n, and then one-to-one event meaning I can automatically say, hey, I want to send a message and only one of you in this set will, will receive it. And so that's kind of what Nats does at the very, very basic levels. And folks always ask me, they go, I just, yeah, I don't need any of that stuff. And I say, okay, a couple things. One, decoupling's good. You know, pets versus cattle is legit. Let's make sure our connective technologies follow the same path and don't say, no, no, this one's special, whether it's an individual server or a load balancer or a special host. You know, it just makes no sense in a modern world. And so we, we push down on those things and we say, OK, got it. Um, the last piece of advice I always give people from the 90s is never assume what a, a message and a message could be a request, could be a data event, you know, all kinds of stuff. But never assume what the message is going to be used for tomorrow. And so everyone kind of looks at me and says, what's that mean? And I say, OK, well, I'll give you a really simple example. When we talk about Nats these days with, you know, very fortunate growing user base and and all kinds of crazy interest from customers and clients these days is modern architectures, distributed architectures are built using connective patterns. And there's really only two. There's lots of nuances to it, but there's two. So it's either a stream or it's a service. And a service is I ask a question, I get an answer. And a stream is I'm just sending a piece of data and I don't care. And to level set, right, distributed systems even up to a couple of years ago, we're dominated like 98 plus percent of everything was a service interaction. Not saying it has to be synchronous, but everything was I'm asking a question and getting an answer, right? HTTP is I ask a question, I get an answer type stuff. So I said, fine. And on day one, you know who's going to be answering that question, right? And so you code it up so that I'm going to send, you know, a question to Matt and Matt's going to respond back with an answer. And you do it on your laptop and you use HTTP or gRPC or whatever. And you're like, see, that's all I need. I go, great. Let's not even get to the point of anyone else being interested in the message. Let's just start with, okay, let's go to production. Well, we need more than one mat. Oh, crap. Well, now we need a load balancer. Well, now we need to, you know, put stuff in and do DNS. And that's fine, though, right? Production can handle it. I don't have to worry about that. So then they do health checks. And then they have to figure out rerouting and all this stuff. And all these big companies have playbooks on exactly how they do it. And they all look very similar, but they're all slightly different, right? Now, let's say someone says, hey, for compliance, we need to be able to watch all requests and we need to record them. Now, all of a sudden, you have to put a logger, right? And you don't want the logger in place of a request response, which is a massive anti-pattern that I see being proliferated these days. It's like, oh, no, put a messaging system in between it and store it on disk and try to re, you know, try it and stuff like that in line with a microservice, in line mm-hmm. with a service interaction. I'm hopped up on Red Bull, but that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Yeah, it's like Google saying, we're going to write all the log entries before we return your search results. It's just foolish. <laughs> no one would ever do that. But there's a need to say, hey, I need to be able to write these things down and someone else is going to look for anomaly detection or you know um, any type of policy enforcement, whatever it is. So look at that system, right? And when you're getting to the end of the day, and now let's say we actually want to spread it out from East Coast to West Coast to Europe, and you need any cast and DNS and all kinds of crazy stuff and coordination on the back end of the state they become really complicated, right? And they're trying to get around the fact that everything is just point to point. It is naturally a one-to-one conversation. Whereas with a messaging system, you write it, you run a NAT server, let's say, or whatever, but think of the NAT server as extremely lightweight. It can run on a Raspberry Pi and your top of the rack switch. You can run in your home router. You know, you can plug and play and put these things together in any arbitrarily complex topology that spans the globe. And that's another discussion on distributed systems that aren't really distributed. So you set up on your laptop and you run the NAT server. It's Docker image. It's been downloaded, I don't know, 150 million times. It just runs. For example, GE, a subsystem of GE doing nuclear stuff, runs our server for two years at a time with no monitoring, no anything. 
And when they come in to change things inside of <laughs> the nuclear uh, reactor type stuff, they shut it down, figure out if they want to upgrade it or not. So it's lightweight. It's always there. It's ubiquitous. It just works, right? So now all of a sudden you write the same program. You're sending requests, getting a response, do it on your laptop. I would argue you'll take the same amount of time or possibly less, but it's on the same level, right? Um, you do have to run a server. But now when you go to the next level of production, right, I need more mats. Well, in NATS, just run more mats. I mean, mats, not mats. mats. <laughs> you know, run more mats. Oh, well, do I have to put in deployment, you know, framework like Kubernetes and service mesh? No, I don't care how you run them. Run them on bare metal and a VM and a container and Kubernetes. Does not matter. Run them anywhere. And the system automatically reacts. By the way, you haven't configured anything on a NAT server yet, ever, right? Now, all of a sudden, you're like, okay, well, what happens if I want to do compliance and I need to watch all the requests coming in? Just start a listener for it, right? It's, it's got all of those patterns built in. And so there's nothing changing between me who's asking the request and Matt who's giving the response. We have to change. Matter of fact, we don't even have to be brought down and restarted. We're just running along and people can come up and bring up anomaly detection, logging, you know, all kinds of stuff. So as you keep making these systems more production ready and, and complex, you realize that messaging gives a huge win over, I think, the other ones. Now, the other ones are kind of known, right? People know how to put up load balancers and know how to do logging and know how to do all this stuff. But when you see something running on a service mesh and you haven't even sent a single request yet, and you're spending $6,000 a month. And I can show you, we can do 60,000 requests a second with all of the service latency tracking, all transparently doing it for real. And it runs on a Raspberry Pi, you know, that also translates to OPEX savings, which is a big deal. Nats has always been known for how fast it is. But most people tell me, but we don't need to go that fast. We don't need to have a server doing 80 to 100 million messages a second. And I go, I know, but if you think about it, if you take that same thing for your workload and put it in the cloud, you can save 80% right on your OPEX budget. So, you know, do people need messaging systems to build stuff? Of course not, because everything, for the most part, is built on essentially HTTP, which, again, is an interesting one to me, unpopular opinion, but I know why we did it that way, and, and we don't have a reason to do it that way anymore, yet it's stuck, right? So the notion of client-server or request-response in the old days was the requester and the responder were usually inside the same network firewall not not firewall specifically but essentially you know we're inside the company right and everyone started to say hey i want the requesters whatever those things are to be able to walk outside of the network the corporate network right and so all of a sudden as people started doing this they go we can't get through the firewall and the firewall people are like the old db people they go no you know it doesn't matter what you ask them they say no and so people kind of went hey wait a minute there's 80 port 80 is always open we can piggyback off that and, and circumvent this whole thing. And so we can just do request response on HTTP or HTTPS and it works. And it's true. And I remember doing some of those tricks myself. We're not in that world anymore. That makes no sense whatsoever to build a modern distributed system off of, you know, technology that existed for something totally different and was a workaround around security and firewall practices. How much time does your team spend building and maintaining internal tooling? I'm talking about those behind the scenes apps, the ones no one else sees, the S3 uploader you built last year for the marketing team, that quick Firebase admin panel that lets you monitor key KPIs, maybe even the tool your data science team hacked together so they could provide custom ad spend analytics. Now these are tools you need so you build them and that makes sense. But the question is, could you have built them in less time, with less effort, and less overhead and maintenance required? And the answer to that question is yes. That's where Retool comes in. Rohan Chopra, Engineering Director at DoorDash, has this to say about Retool. Quote, the tools we've been able to quickly build with Retool have allowed us to empower and scale our local operators, all while reducing the dependency on engineering, end quote. Now, the internal tooling process at DoorDash was bogged down with manual data entry, missed handoffs, and long turnaround times. And after integrating Retool, DoorDash was able to cut the engineering time required to build tools by a factor of 10x and eliminate the error-prone manual processes that plague their workflows. They were able to empower backend engineers who wouldn't otherwise be able to build front ends from scratch. And these engineers were able to build fully functional apps in Retool in hours, not days or weeks. Your next step is to try it free at retool.com slash changelog. Again, retool.com slash changelog.
want to ask you some questions, I guess, from a slightly different perspective. So a lot of the things I build are very, very small. And like when you talk about, for instance, logging something before you send a response, I am guilty of, in my early days, building a service that literally logged every request to a, a SQL database before responding. And you know, now it seems ridiculous, but at the time, the request load was so low that it really didn't actually matter that much. You know, it was just a simple solution to fix it, and we could quickly browse requests and actually track things, and it made support way easier at the time. So, like, if, if I'm somebody like that, where I'm sort of starting off in a smaller project or working on my own or doing something like that, where do you see people get into messaging systems? Like, what problems do you commonly see them tackle that they would want to look at it? And, you know, what are your suggestions for ways to sort of get introduced to them? Because, obviously, a lot of people aren't going to jump into these really complex scenarios. Yeah, and that's that's totally fair. And the biggest one we've seen early on uh, with people starting to get interested in it is simple load balancing. So even though the request might be handled by you know a single one, they wanted more than one, and they were immediately thrown into you know utilizing load balancers from a cloud provider or setting one up themselves. And you know from there, if they are aware of NATS at all or another messaging system, but NATS especially in terms of it's just so drop dead simple. There's no configuration. And you get load balancing for any number of groups that you want to create. So you can have production, dev, test, you know, the system essentially dynamically responds to the fact that you say, hey, I'm interested in this request and I want to be part of this group, right? I want to be part of uh, the go time group. And the system just automatically responds. And so immediately they have less moving pieces and less OPEX time in, in terms of, you know, time spent trying to make sure that the system's up, monitoring all the other pieces. So we've seen that. But I mean, it's totally a fair question. And it's interesting. I've shown people how easy it is to do request response when they're doing HTTP. And we can do it just as, as quickly, even run the server, because with Docker now, it's so easy to just say, Docker run, that's, and then it's like, oh, that was it? And it's like, yeah, you have a server now, so you can do anything you want on, on your platform. But you're right. And until people start feeling pain, you know, they, they're, they're not going to be looking. Or they, they want to find a solution that they don't think exists. And if they see that it's enabled by a, a different technology, then that, that'll draw them to it as well. Does it have advantages beyond the kind of production side? Does it have advantages for software design itself? Because, of course, if you think we're going to suddenly treat these things slightly differently, we're going to be communicating through this message queue, that has some impact, doesn't it, on your, how you then think about the design of your application? It, it, yes, it can. But again, this is, is this is one where I think people still equate messaging systems with a single broker and queuing and back from the 90s type stuff. NATS is extremely good at routing and framing. And that's it. But what is interesting now is, is that NATS is extremely lightweight. So a server can run anywhere. It can run on your phone or wherever. And you can Lego brick these together into any topology that, that you want. And so if you think of it that way and you don't think, oh, I've got to go through this queue where it's, I'm just routing a request to the appropriate responder and getting the response back. Even just with that simple model, right? You've removed a lot of moving pieces in the transition from dev to production. The other thing that's really interesting to us, and again, this is where microservices has driven a lot of this, I think, is all of a sudden with microservices, it's like, wow, I'm doing point to point, which you can argue for or against. I'm against, but I understand why people say it. But what people are interestingly enough, you know, struggling with is addressing a discovery and security. Everyone has, you know, their own security. And then someone raises their hand in the org and says, we can create a, you know, one or, you know, security model type stuff. And it's usually painful. It's hard to do that. And it affects the developers themselves. And you don't have that really clean decoupling, right? Natch tries to preserve that. So the program that I write on day one that goes into production literally has one thing that changes, which is what are my credentials? So you say Nats connect and you give it a URL to a system. So we have a global system that runs all over the world, every major cloud provider, every major geo, all you need is a single URL and it just works. We find the closest server, we do all the right stuff for you. But the only thing to go from dev to prod is, you know, hey, we need credentials to prove who we are. But now all of a sudden you have a consistent identity authentication and authorization system that has no private keys or passwords ever shared with the system itself. And it just kind of works. In other words, that pain point of, oh crap, now we got to get secure and locked down and stuff also goes away. Right. And a lot of times when you're playing around, hobbying out, doing stuff, you don't see that, especially for enterprise or playing around with services that are usually exposed over the web. 
where we have seen people immediately jump on something like this is um, IoT and the IoT landscape where people are like, mm. crap, you know, we've, we don't really have anything. And the thing we have really doesn't have a cohesive server backend. In other words, there's a lot of decisions if you've got an MQTT client in your device, but you don't know what to do. Um, so we haven't landed it yet, but we've committed to it, promised it, and we've been coding on it, this notion that, hey, you can just take those apps and connect them to an app server too. And this is a global topology, meaning your IoT stuff will work anywhere in the world. You can sell your, you know, your gadget, your software, or whatever to anyone, wherever they are in the world, and they'll get a good experience, so to speak. Hmm. That is really cool, isn't it? <laughs> if you think about that. What's interesting is, I mean, I'll be frank with you, you know, with, we see a lot of folks we're starting to hit this weird bow wave, which is, to be honest with you, making us a little uncomfortable as an ecosystem because we were always under the radar, didn't have a lot of attention type stuff, which was nicer than we thought, uh, but it's still good. But what we're seeing now is everyone coming to our front door is either of two mindsets. One is, holy smokes, Kafka is too complex, too costly, too blah, 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 help me. Or it's this pattern where they say, we've got centralized thingies that can do request response, right? We can ask like the central thing about certain things, but we have all these remotes and we want the remotes to be semi-autonomous. In other words, we want them to be able to communicate amongst themselves, seamlessly and securely communicate with a central service. They might be generating telemetry data, right? So there's notion of streaming that getting collected. And what's interesting is, is that these use cases are all over the board from a, the person walking in the front door saying, hey, this is the problem we're trying to solve. But when you look at it as, do you have a centralized thing and you have these things as remotes where remotes can be anything, it all of a sudden starts lighting up as the same pattern. They just want a consistent communication system, multiple operators. You can run your own servers. I can run my own servers, but the system still works. It's almost like being able to put a cell tower in your backyard and having great cell service when you're at the house. But as soon as you leave, it just transparently works. It, it connects to Verizon or AT&T or, or whatever. And so when we present that to them and whether they're talking about, you know, the end point is like a Bose headset or a Peloton bike or, or it's a factory or a plant or it's a telephone pole or it's a whatever, we're like it's the same pattern. You have some centralized service that does services and it collects data. It might actually throw off data as well, telemetry or, or sensor type data. And, you know, the remote, let's say it's an airport, right? It can operate on itself. It's got its own servers, the airport staff you know, monitors those servers and it runs them, but the security model is cohesive to all the backend service providers, the airlines, whatever that is. And so those patterns we've seen appear quite a bit and, and not in only people that know all the buzzword bingo of Kubernetes and service mesh and cloud native, it's more traditional systems that are trying to do more, right? They're trying to expose more data at these remotes, right? Throwing off more data, doing things with it locally, uploading it or, or centralizing it. And um, we see that pattern repeat and, and present itself six, seven, eight, ten times a week, nonstop mm. these days. Yeah, so it feels like you've actually identified a real kind of good abstraction for a lot of this stuff. Because that's, the I think, the big problem whenever we try and solve problems like this in a generic way is, you know, you build it for one case and it's perfect and it doesn't quite fit with the next case. But close enough, a few bits of configuration get you through it. And then, you know, the third case, it really doesn't fit at all, but it's too late. This is our, you know. And so this, yeah, that that does sound right. Do you have lots of examples then? Are there lots of examples where NATS in particular is used in IoT? The IoT stuff is new and up and coming. Everyone is looking heavily. And right now, most of them are bridging across MQTT directly, usually on device or on controller. So plants, factories, we're seeing a lot of that stuff. And they're desperately waiting for us to put together the, the native connectivity so that they can have a cohesive one type of system to manage, right? It's not a bunch of silos that they're trying to glue together. And what's neat is, is that there, there's one other thing that Nats did uh, about two and a half years ago that um, we thought was kind of important, maybe for certain use cases. And what's happened is it's, it's exploded into one of the most targeted things. Well, there's two of them that we did. One was is that we we made it truly multi-tenant. So earlier in the in the podcast, we were talking about distributed systems. And I would argue most distributed systems aren't distributed if you really want to stretch them. So 
pick your favorite open source technology and, and that you consider a distributed system and tell me how well does it do if you have pieces on the West Coast, East Coast, Europe, and Asia Pac. And most of those projects will say, yeah, don't do that. Just run it in one region, right? It's a distributed system, but it's a one region distributed system, which is totally fine, by the way, because Nats was the same way about two years ago before we dipped into we need this ability to span the whole globe if we want to type stuff. But we knew it had to be multi-tenant and it had to be, I call it, uh, I'm dating myself, but I call it Pepsi and Coke secure meeting. They'll use cell towers and cell service, but certain software, they're saying, if Coke is here, there's no way we're going to use it type stuff, right? So it had to understand that. And so we created the notion of accounts. So think of it like a, a sandbox or container for messaging. All the users of that account can see each other no matter where they connect in the world, but they cannot by default see anybody else's account. But we, we introduced the notion of isolated by default, but secure sharing. So remember, not talking pub sub, but talking streams and services. You can say, I want to export one of these, and then other people can import it. And it's like a Facebook thing. Both of you have to agree that you want to do it. And you can make it public, but most of the people say, no, you need permission from me. I, I will sign off on a token that essentially, which is public private key cryptography. So no private keys ever in the system, meaning you don't have to trust the operator of the server to really for it to do the right thing, uh, to allow them to cross these boundaries. And so that was a huge win. And there's, there's even a, a smaller example that, that a little off in the weeds, so we won't go too far down it, but this notion that people who do know messaging systems and been using them, it's like, wow, we used to have two week design sessions on the subject space or the topic space, how many tokens and what's where and who can't step on each other's foot. And when we did this, everyone realized that they were so lightweight that they're like throwaway. So organizations are putting a single account for every microservice that they do. And then their imports are their dependencies. <laughs> and then their export is their, their API. And so one of the other things, too, is it's your sandbox. It's your world. So when you import something, no one else can tell you what to do with your subject space. So you tell the system where you want it to show up. So I could release a service that just says, send me a request on request, and I'll send you a response. And you can import and say, I want it on Derek.CoolService.Request or whatever. And the system you know, transparently does that. But the kicker was is that, and we did this with our own system, and people have started really getting onto this, is, yes, you can put it wherever you want. So I could export something like NGS is our global system, but NGS.Usage.Star. And it's a service, meaning you send me a request, right? Service interaction, I send you a response. And I'm expecting ngs.usage.something. Star is a wild card in our, our terminology. And so Johnny comes in and says, yep, I, I want to sign up. And I go, great, here's a secure token that you can be allowed to import this. But what you can import is ngs.usage.johnny. And that's it. So you cannot send to ngs.usage.derek or Matt or whoever, blah, blah. But again, Johnny controls his own sandbox. So what he says, he goes, great, I'm just going to stick it at ngs.usage. So now all of a sudden what happens is, is that everybody's experience is, hey, if you want usage, you just send a request that looks like 1H for one hour or 24 hours or whatever to the same subject, and you get a response, JSON, all bytes and messages sent and received. But the back end knows that it's guaranteed to receive messages only from people it's authorized, and it's guaranteed that that last token is who you are. So they have a secure context built in. So now you can build a system where that secure, you know, authoritative context, you know, semantic context of who's doing the request is something you don't have to think about. You don't have to build lots and lots of stuff on top of to kind of get it. So I know that's a little geeky, um, but we've seen people who the, the light bulb goes off and they go, holy smokes. And then I can deploy these responders anywhere I want. The other big thing that we did, which again is it's subtle and it's, I haven't seen anyone else do it, but I wanted to talk more about the abstract is we've seen for many years, and I've seen this for a lot of my career as cloud and, and SaaS took off, that it was an or conversation. You could run your own servers or you could use the cloud service, right? And so we thought really hard about, hey, how can we make this an and conversation? And so what we did was we said, hey, we have all these different network topologies, which are just ways servers talk to each other. So they can form small clusters, and then you can put clusters of clusters together into super clusters and all kinds of fun stuff. And they all use different topologies. Why don't we create one that allows you to, you know, extend a super cluster at will, like a hub and spoke? 
And so when we did that and we said, and by the way, you can mix and match operators and security models, meaning you can use a shared SaaS utility inside of a big Fortune 50 company or a global utility, but you can also run your own servers and have the best of both worlds. Those two things that account isolation with secure sharing and then the ability to mix and match a utility model. If you guys have dealt with enterprise companies, and I know you have, we see a lot of this. Hey, we, we had a problem and we picked this technology and we did a POC. Then we did four POCs. And then someone raised a hand in one of the meetings and said, hey, why instead of having four silos or six silos, let's create a utility that everyone can use. But you, you either have to use it or you don't, but we're going to mandate that you do it. And there's two things that happen. One is, is the effort fails spectacularly because the code is not actually multi-tenant. It doesn't really understand it. And it can't stretch, right? It can't actually serve as people in the East Coast, West Coast, Europe, whatever. Or people go, no, nope, I'm not going to do that. I'm running my own servers anyway. And so we, we heard that so much, uh, even in the uh, previous company, um, Epsera, that I was like, man, if we can kind of give them the ability to have the best of both worlds, that could be interesting. And, and we did it because we knew we were going to do MQTT. So we have to honor their security model, which I believe still username, password, or client cert is the highest level they have. Um, but it would have to mix and match into a global NAT system that might be using our forward private key, public key scenario. But those two have really resonated with a lot of folks trying to solve these problems. I wish I could have predicted, but I, I'm not that smart. I didn't. Um, but we're excited about it. Mm. Well, I talk about predicting things that people are going to need. NATS 2.0 is generally available, as it says on your website. What was the change? What, why did you need the breaking major version update? What changed so significantly, and, and how did that come about? The way NAT 2.0 came about was, I tried to think through the notion of, is, is there an opportunity to create a company where NATS might play a role? Prior to 2.0, NATS was rock solid, performant. You know, Again, it was like a lot of distributed systems today, you couldn't stretch it. It liked to be kind of close to its neighbor, have good throughput, good RTT type stuff. And it, it wasn't a company, by the way. And, and a lot of companies, startups, you know, aren't companies. They're just features uh, for other systems. So I really wanted to think hard about that problem, regardless of whether Nats was a fit. And what I came up with, and we'll see if, if I'm right or, or, or wrong, probably wrong, but that's okay, was is that, you know, the, the notion of the internet that defining moment, 94, 95, and then in the early 2000s with the realization of the global cellular network and what those two platforms with hyper-connectivity provided and actually ended up, we haven't had that event for digital system services or devices, right? And we, we, we pick a different technology, even if we use the same technology in the same company, it's siloed out the yin-yang, you've got 40,000 Rabbit and Q servers running or whatever that is. So I said, what if we try to create the first secure digital dial tone for digital system services and devices that all they do is connect and it's kind of like connecting to the cell tower. You're, you're, you're not even aware of it. It just kind of works and it's all in the background, but we have the ability to securely connect to anything uh, that's out there. And so that's where we started. And that's was not up for that. It needed three major things that we identified right off the get go. And then the fourth one that we just talked about, about that hub and spoke extending utility, SaaS, and, and private owner mix. But the first three were pretty simple. Security model had to really be forward looking. And there's lots of fun, interesting math and all kinds of cool stuff underneath the covers. But the easy version is the system should never have private keys or passwords, period. I mean, it's really simple. So if someone roots you know, all of our NAT server devices and steals them all, they don't have anything, right? So we did that. Second was multi-tenancy, which we talked about. Uh, that was a big one. Uh, multi-tenancy is not something you can slap on top. By the way, security isn't either, but most people slap both of them on at the end. Um, <laughs> it just doesn't work. And so multi-tenancy was uh, go all the way down to the you know, root end of the code base and start from the ground up. And then the last one was global topology. So the ability to have a network topology span lossy systems, uh, very high RTT, uh, low signal to noise ratio types of things. You can't use the same topology to talk between servers that you expect to be really close and buddy buddy with as to one all the way in you know China let's say and so those three main things had to be done now what's nice is is that you know as you get older you you remember lots of stuff meaning uh, we knew we could never break anyone that was using NAT before 
So it's totally backward compatible. Any config that works with NATS 1.0 will work with NATS 2.0. Everything works, which was hard, but it, we thought it was important. But the, the major version was to signal, this is something different. This is not a message broker, uh, a queue. It is a ubiquitous routing and framing technology. It can run anywhere and can do any type of pattern, but the major ones are services and streams. So with this sort of approach now, is it a fair comparison to for somebody to be like, well, I want some sort of a broker system, so I'm going to consider, say, maybe SQS or RabbitMQ, and I'm going to also toss NATS in there. Like, Are they even solving the same kinds of problems anymore, or do you think just it's a fair comparison? No, I think they're, you know, they, they, they're basically solving similar problems, but again, you, you run out of runway. So with siloed, you know, not true multi-tenant, the security angle, all that stuff, we've seen a lot of legacy messaging tech coming to us with a pain point somewhere in that realm. We're tired of managing all these silos. And every time we want to connect two things, we got to figure out how to glue these two separate systems together just to take advantage of something that we should have just been able to flip a switch and it just works type stuff. But we don't see a lot of people come and say we want to mix and match like SQS or Google Pub Sub. I mean, we've seen it a little bit, but usually they go all in on that, you know, after they've talked with us. Now, where we have seen interop uh, is with MQ series and Kafka, right? People want to run NATS and they still want to run the, the Kafka, whether it's an existing investment or, you know, something new, they just want it there and it's not going away. And so we want to protect that investment. So we've done a lot of those interactions. Mm, that is really cool. The Change Log is deep discussions in and around the world of software, and it's been going for over a decade. We interview hackers like Chris Anderson from 3D Robotics. At the time, drones were like predators and global hawks and military industrial, and they were classified and super, you know, $10 billion things. And we had just built a drone with Lego pieces around the dining room table programmed by a nine-year-old. And it's like, okay, that should not be possible. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not, it, when, when a nine-year-old can do something that is classified, that literally export control as munition with Lego, with toy pieces, it was something important in this world has changed. Leaders like Devin Zugel from GitHub. In the like 10 to 15 year range or 20 year range, what I would really like is for if you have like three 12 year olds hanging out and one of them's like, I want to be a firefighter. Another one's like, I want to be a lawyer. I want one of them to say that I want to be an open source developer. And innovators like Amel Hussein. I've yet to kind of see applications at scale that don't use multiple languages, that don't have just arcane stories behind why this weirdo thing exists, you know? Like, all right, when you open this file, you're going to have to turn around three yeah. times and tap your nose <laughs> once. <laughs> Like it's just, it's the, just the most hilarious stories, you know? But applications are living, breathing, they have craft, that's normal. So I want to normalize weirdness because that's just how applications evolve over time. Welcome to the Changelog. Please listen to an episode from our catalog that interests you and subscribe today. We'd love to have you with us. So the company then that you talked about that was built around the technology, how does that work then? I mean, this is a tech podcast, but I know a lot of the listeners are also quite interested in sort of commercial aspects as well of things like this. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a great question. And hopefully the listeners will enjoy the next four hours of dialogue. On this <laughs> if they listen to it on two times, though, that is only two hours. So. <laughs> yeah. Frankly, um, you know, open source and smaller companies that are trying to make a viable business directly off of open source is a challenge. You know, the whole industry is, is going through some really serious pains because a lot of the open source is being funded through indirect revenue channels where, like Google, right? They don't have to charge you, you know, to license Kubernetes or do whatever like that. They're making money. I mean, they have the reasons for doing it, but they're making their money elsewhere, which means that it drives a consumer bias that it should be free. And that's a challenge. And um, I saw that with my last company, you know, full board. It's, it's a huge challenge. And so part of that 
what do we want to build a company to do um, was equally weighted with how are we going to make it a viable business. And so for me, again, very unpopular, I'm sure, opinion. I, I personally don't believe in open core. I think it's freemium enterprise repackaged and it's going to fail just like freemium enterprise did. I could be wrong, but my bet was is that there's really only three ways to make money off of open source. Uh, run it as a service, bundle it with hardware because a consumer bias of a physical thing totally changes their bias um, and they have no problem paying for it. And then the last one is augment with a service. And so some people will kind of push back and say, well, that's open core. But the distinction is it's kind of like your phone and a AT&T contract, right? You're augmenting your phone with that and it makes it better and it makes it actually, you know, you need a, a telephone or a cellular plan or whatever. But I do draw that distinction. And so what we did was we looked at how do we take those three rules, um, which could be wrong, but, you know, that's my bet. And where do we go? Because running NATS as a service, as a silo, this is a big deal. It was a no-op. We tried it at Absera. No one signed up. And, and they were so nice to us. And they said, we, Derek, we literally run this on a Docker container and it's been running for three years now. We don't even monitor it. We don't even care, <laughs> right, uh, type stuff. So why are we going to pay you to run a singleton? So we, we thought to ourselves, how do we make it such that the, the sum is greater than, you know, the, the parts type stuff? And so one is, is that we can create a global network, all cloud providers, all major geos, which you can do yourself. There's nothing that's not open source to do that. But it's cost prohibitive if you just want to, you know, use two sites, one in Europe and one in the U.S. type stuff. So we did that, obviously. There's always the notion of on-premise recurring support. That's kind of the marquee that you want. Um, NRE, consulting, training, education is usually one-to-one. -one, so you don't get a market multiplier there whatsoever. Recurring support, if it actually is clean, you can get your 10x plus kicker. For those who uh, know all the, you know, the market value accelerators and things like that. So we care deeply about that. We do do NRE training consulting, but it's we know it's not a huge source of revenue. It's a huge source of customer experience and satisfaction, but not revenue. So we have the SaaS model with NGS. We have on-premise recurring support for our stuff. And whether it's good or bad, a lot of people coming to Nats now are like, wow, that's so cool. It took me two seconds to write the Nats app. And, and run it against the demo servers, which have always been free and available and, and, and such like that, I'm going to do something hard. It's just natural. Engineers are just like that. They're like, that was too easy. I want to do something hard. So Nats now allows you to set up some crazy complex topology with some crazy security rules. And so they try to do that. So now all of a sudden, because of that complexity, people go, oh, we want to get support. I don't like that. I like things that are simple and just work, but we have noticed that. The other thing that's interesting from our perspective is, is that we don't believe NATS is just a connective technology. It is, but from a, how do you value it as a, as a user? Um, you know, I've been doing this so long, my bias is everything is just a message, right? So whether you're <laughs> using a database driver or whatever, you're just sending messages back and forth. So what happens if we say everything is just a NATS message? So what I mean by that is, is, you know, you get everything the NATS does, you connect, you, you know, distributed queuing, load balancing, circuit breaking, self-healing. It puts itself back together, by the way, without any help from any platform technology type stuff, really. But what happens if we said, hey, you know, that export and import, you know, the streams and services and you can export one and someone can import it. What happens if the system just has a service that you can import that says it's a KV service and now you can do zero trust secure key value set and, and get from anywhere in the world with any application. Hmm. Okay. Now all of a sudden Nats can do simple state storage and retrieval. Doesn't solve all the apps, doesn't solve war hunger, but Hey, okay. Now what happens if it can do object storage? Very, very large objects, very, very efficiently. The system dynamically moves things around. It understands where requests are coming from. And again, because we don't care, we can just move Matt and run them wherever without anything special coordinating. That's very possible. Uh, and then, you know, going further, it's like, well, what happens if it's like there's a GraphQL service and I'm just sending requests over NATS to a GraphQL service, but all the security works, all the authorization, authentication is built in. It's what I know. It just kind of works. So those would be premium services that we could charge for, right? So you get, I call it basic cable, you know, the dial tone, and then you can get the premium uh, channels a la carte if, if you want to. And then the last piece of the business model is some of those may be very compelling, let's say anomaly detection or some advanced analytical statistics on traffic patterns and stuff like that. 
that a company might say, we really want to use that service, but we can't use yours. We have to run it on our own, in our own data center, our own, you know, VPS, blah, 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 whatever that is, then that's software license revenue. The way we envision the company succeeding is, is the first bow wave, the first two to four years will be recurring support as a major revenue driver. And then as we land, we landed web and mobile, we're about to land MQTT for IoT. Those two will drive more of the, the NGS stuff direct, or they create a leaf node that they connect to, but they use NGS to talk across the world, which we have a couple of folks doing already. That's kind of the whole business model in a nutshell. We'll see how it works out, but it's, it's a challenge for sure. The consumer bias that it should be free is the hardest thing for any OSS developer to fight against. So I, th I feel like you run into that sort of thing even beyond like open source software. It's kind of a weird thing, I guess, in the software world is that uh, to give an example, like people write tutorials and books and stuff like that that teach things. And in most environments, people expect to go out and have to buy a book. But in the programming world, it's very common to assume, well, somebody will just make this free. Um, and that happens for all sorts of things. And I think like there, there is some upside to trying to help people access things and trying to make it accessible to the world. But then there's also, like you said, that that flip side of it's very hard to support unless you sort of get to a certain, like a Google scale or some sort of scale where it's possible. Because prior to then, it can be very, very challenging. I, I think you raise a great point. And, and one of the things that I debate with folks quite a bit is, you know, the, the notion and how people frame support. Uh, so people go, oh, I'm paying you because of me. And if something's wrong, I want you to help me, which I totally get. But if you look at like healthcare systems, right, the, the, the Western worlds mostly do the same thing. I pay for, you know, healthcare when I'm sick type stuff for when I'm sick. But if you look at like um, Asia Pacific countries, right, it's the opposite. You pay for insurance or you pay a doctor when you're well. You don't pay them when you're sick. So I've had this debate, and to be honest with you, I lose most of the time um, with customers saying, you've been running this for two years. You just said we love it. It's been running for two years. We haven't had to touch it. We haven't even, don't even monitor it. Why would we want to pay for support? And I say, you want to pay for support so that as we keep making it better, it keeps doing this thing where you never have to have an issue to deal with or, or they're very low. But to be honest with you, it falls on deaf ears most of the time. It's very, very challenging. We have a ton of usage production usage in the tens of thousands of users and a minuscule percentage of people that want to pay support. Hmm. Stop writing such good software. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know what? I dealt with that early in my career where people were like, you need to make the book, you know, longer. I didn't write a book, but it was like for a, a manual. It has to be like 200 some pages so we can charge more or it needs to be more complex. They need us to get it up and running. And I, I just resisted that. You know, I said, that just doesn't feel right. It should be simple and approachable, both from an application standpoint and an OPEX standpoint. But the current state of the world is, is that if it actually nails all of those, you will plummet your voluntary support contracts for sure. It, some of this is challenging because, like you even said, like the open core model is, I think that one's hard to get right because it doesn't work for a lot of software. Like an example in the Go world is a lot of people probably use Caddy Server. And I think when they tried to transition to a paid model, they struggled because the core thing that a lot of people really wanted was it was hard to charge for that because it was already there. They were used to getting it free. But then like you, you come from the, I think you said the Rails world. Did you mention Rails earlier or Ruby? Yeah, I mean, I definitely uh, was more Ruby, but I was definitely, you know, understood the Rails community and all that. Okay. So in the Rails world, there was something called Sidekick, which is oh. like a background, you know, job processing job. type thing. Yeah. So whenever that came out, like it's it's something that, the core of what a free user would need is actually there for the free users, but the like they actually had a nice separation between what enterprise users would actually want and pay for. So as a result, that has worked well for them. But I think that most open source, it's very hard to find that distinction and that causes issues where it's really hard to make that business model work because either nobody pays you or you basically make software that the free users can't get any value out of it. So I mean, going back to the metaphor you had with the phone and like you can buy an AT&T plan, it's almost like, you, you sell them a phone and say, you have to pay me for the battery though. And they're like, well, it's not very useful now. I, that's not augmenting it. That's like making it functional. No, you're absolutely right. And, um, you know, and w what was interesting and, and you could see this a little bit with the Kubernetes ecosystem is a lot of people would knee jerk around a new technology taking off 
and approaching, let's say, an open core model saying, well, we're going to add monitoring and management tooling that makes it easier to blank, whatever. And I had a friendly bet with a, a bunch of folks that, that I know and known for years to say, here's why I don't think the, the open core model will work because these technologies now, when they become very ubiquitous, right? Kubernetes is not easy, but you can get through it and there's a large ecosystem. And so there's a ton of people working on it. The first thing that ecosystem was going to do today, which it used to not do, right? Because the, the barrier to entry was too high for someone to sit down and write a monitoring and management system. As I said, these economies spike so fast and uh, the ecosystem, sorry, so fast and so quickly that anything that looks like an easy tangential uh, business opportunity around an open core model will get sucked in. And so everyone complained on the first versions of Kubernetes about lack of monitoring, management, tooling, dashboards, whatever. And I think it took them less than two releases to have a skeleton version of that. And then of course, no one now would start a business on a dashboard for Kubernetes type stuff. So you have to think, hey, how do I make what I'm offering way more valuable as a service, right? And again, that's even a challenge because if you really do nail the experience for a single use case, you might struggle with where's the value of you running it for me versus me just going Docker run or whatever type stuff. But I think this notion of uh, this macro trend that I believe the opportunity to enable this hyper-connectivity opportunity for all the digital system services and devices is huge if it's done right. But it has to be very approachable, very easy, open source, good governance model, good, obviously, OSS licensing. I've gone through all the, the phases of closed open source and licenses and governance bodies. And you can mix and match models, meaning I could use, you know, in Google Cloud, Google Cloud's version uh, that runs great. But if I once run my own server, I could, and it all just kind of works seamlessly. I do believe that has value that people would want to pay for. Now, the basic dial tone that we talked about, just for, for the listeners, you know, that is going to be a low margin volume play. The premium services, we can get better margins, we think. Um, and of course, on premise, the recurring support, we've got multiple tiers there. But it's definitely something that folks who are thinking about starting a company, I, I don't want to ever, you know, dissuade someone from starting a company because I think it's great. You know, I think it's amazing. But it's it's very hard. It's very lonely. But I, I do encourage you to think really hard. Am I building a company or a feature, a technology feature? And if you're building a company, do I have really you know, thought out vision for what the business model looks like? Or I just say, oh, I'll figure it out once I get you know, a whole bunch of eyeballs and millions of users and I'll, I'll convert mm. them. That doesn't work as much anymore. So. Yeah, that is so true, this, the, the perception problem that is a challenge for people we had a similar thing we had this technology that was extracting metadata from video content using machine learning so a machine learning models would look at the video frames and then actually be able to kind of describe the what's going on in a video and of course make that searchable and all those things you can imagine once you've done that so we were thinking maybe maybe that would be charged per gigabyte or something uh, and then we tested it and people were saying well uh, to store on amazon it's only two cents a gigabyte or something <laughs> and we're like well yeah but <laughs> that's just storing it this is using <laughs> machines that and they're like no it has to you know it's way more expensive than amazon and it was like <laughs> okay so you know common sense we almost should just not assume that there's common sense around uh, you know <laughs> from my point of view that was you know what i mean and I'm an angel investor and I consult with lots of smaller companies and, you know, a lot of companies struggle with how do I turn it into a business? And I said, figure out a way where my experience with your software becomes better if you have a system that collects data from everyone, keeps the privacy concerns in place. That's a big, big deal, of course, but, you know, keeps, uh, you know, all of that stuff at bay, but and essentially makes my use of the product better because of, of the access. So, I mean, I was fortunate enough to work at Google from 2003 to, I think, 2010 or so. And I remember some of the, you know, obviously Google has a lot of extremely bright people that think of very, very elegant, complex solutions of very, very hard problems. But what I, I liked to see a lot within Google was extremely simple <laughs> solutions to complex problems. And so the... Spam was a huge deal, right, when Gmail came out. Um, it was just awful. But as, as Gmail became so popular, and we, and we had lots of usage on it, right? I mean, uh, even in the early days, 
that if we just put a little button that said, hey, I don't like this message, it's spam. <laughs> and then it, it would see all the signals and say, wow, you know, in the last five seconds, a thousand people clicked on the same message that it was spam, that we can automatically market and move it off, you know. And so that power of collecting data and using it to optimize individuals' experiences is a model that I've talked to a lot of startups about. Say, think of, can you encapsulate what you're trying to do with your software where the service is augmenting, right? It's not an open core. You're augmenting with it, but your experience gets tremendously better because of it. And it's something they can't recreate. So for your, Matt, your case, I agree with you. It's, they're, they're just saying, wait a minute, I can store a gig of my own data for way cheaper and you're, you're doing it. But if you said, hey, can you collect all of the spam signals from, you know, 40 million people type stuff for, for Gmail, they can't do that, right? They, they, they're just like, I can't do that. So then what happens is they go, I know I can't do that on my own. Does it really help me that much that I'm willing to pay for it? And that's, that's always, you know, the, the, the trade-off. It's funny because that is almost exactly kind of the way it went. <laughs> so it's really funny you say that. It is indeed time for uh, our unpopular opinions. Oh, unpopular opinions. I actually think you should probably leave. Oh, unpopular opinions. I know you've dropped a lot of gems throughout the show here. But I'm wondering if you have a, a solid, solid, unpopular opinion for us. Well, in terms of the gems, remember, it's advice and it's free, so you get what you pay for. So <laughs> mileage may vary. I'm usually never short on unpopular opinion. So my, my two probably that are applicable to this is, is that most systems that you think are distributed aren't. So you pick your favorite open source, and I'm telling you, it's distributed as long as it's all close together. If you try to stretch it, it's not distributed anymore. And, and the other one is, is that I really do feel that, that us using HTTP to connect modern distributed systems where you have to have sidecars and proxies and load balancers and everything under the sun is just uh, madness. It's just, I cannot believe people keep doing it and go, yep, that's the way we should do it. You know, I understand how we got here. I can't understand how we haven't got to a tipping point to go, hey, we don't have to do it like that anymore, you know, because everything's modernized. So we can actually do something real now type stuff. So those are my two. Yeah, that is a pretty good one. There's examples in real life like that. I find real life is basically like someone's legacy code and we're just born into it. And then we've got to, <laughs> now we're like, why would that be the way it is? But yeah, I, I kind of get it. I get what you mean. I like that. You're right. HTTP is sort of uh, kind of crazy, but but it works, doesn't it? It's, it just works. It mostly works. And so it wins. Most of the time. <laughs> it, it, it works if you have a large team that can watch everything and keep the lights on. So if you don't have to deal with it, you know, then for you, it's like, why? I, this, this works the same. If all of a sudden you go, yep, it just works. But man, I don't want to be spending $8,000 a month on my little system. So now I'm going to do it myself. Then all of a sudden you start to realize, why are, do we have all, you know, and this whole notion, I guess a third smaller one, but this whole notion of, Architect everything with sidecars. Uh, that also drives me nuts. It's like, oh, just add another sidecar, you know, to it. It's, hmm. um, yeah, that, yeah. It doesn't stay simple for very long, does it? When you have to kind of tackle things like that, tackle problems no, like that. No, it, it doesn't. And and to be honest with you, you know, we're we're getting to, you know, we're in a weird global situation, as we all know. And my hope and thoughts are with all the listeners, and hope you're safe and healthy and, and all that kind of stuff. But when you go, you know, and you're looking at a company and you're trying to figure out how to drive revenue, we talked a lot about different pieces, but I'll tell you, at the end of the day, you're either selling a vitamin or an aspirin. And when times get tough, people stop buying vitamins, right? And so if you can figure out a pain point and make it easier for folks, that always is easier than everything else. And so for Nats, to be honest with you, it's twofold. One is, is OPEX spend is too high, too many moving pieces or just it's too expensive to put it on. Google Pub Sub, if we're trying to do, I don't know, 2 million messages a second type stuff. So it's like, great, we can cut your OPEX out, no big deal. Or it's that pattern we talked about early in the show of, I've got lots of remote thingies that I all want to communicate, east, west, north, south, to a central thing, and, and I don't want to have to worry so much about security and that it's just one ubiquitous communication stuff. So those two pain points are, are what's mostly driving us as a business. Maybe not Nats as a project and an open source technology, but us as a business, it's solving those pain points. So, 
Great, very interesting. Thank you very much. Thanks for all the uh, insights into the commercial side as well. We often don't explore that on this show. That is true. Happy to share. And like I said, I'm mostly probably wrong, so don't. Uh... <laughs> That's fair enough. <laughs> like HTTP. <laughs> yeah, a lot of stars on the back. <laughs> yeah. The hard part there is I think almost every open source project has been mostly wrong when trying to figure out how to build a business around it. <laughs> like even ones, I'm thinking of like Core OS. I don't know how well they did, but they had to be acquired. And I assumed that if they had a better alternative, they wouldn't have done that. So, yeah, like you see ones like that, and I'm like, Core OS seemed like it was doing very well, and unfortunately, no. <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting. It's you know, building a software company is you can get a lot of mileage out of thinking of it as a psychology problem than a technical or market or go to market strategy. So, I try to frame everything now as is what is the psychology of the consumer? And so, if you're building a kernel right? Except if you're Microsoft, which, you know, even there, they'll have to let go of it shortly as, oh, those are always free. Even though there's probably multiple hundreds of millions of dollars of expertise and investment into these, the consumer bias is it should be free. So always ask yourself, what is my consumer look like? And what is their bias around what I'm trying to offer them? If you resoundingly say, oh, crap, they're going to think it has to be free. You might want to rethink what, what you're trying to do. That's in, that is my, can we just all start going into stores and thinking <laughs> this should all be free will that work <laughs> if we all do it that's where i said oss bundling with hardware is one of my mm. three models because the consumer bias around physical things is you have to pay for them yeah. right i think mm. we were we were talking earlier about a book like if i have you know i have to buy the book right even if it's audible i have to buy the book type stuff so mm-hmm. that actually, by the way, with our IoT strategy, which is slowly developing and, and we're, we're, we're launching it, but the notion of saying, hey, there's some functionality, but it's built onto this little teeny thing that you buy, even if it only costs you like eight bucks or, you know, 30 bucks, mm-hmm. the consumer bias is it's not zero, which is the biggest thing. So the hardest is to go yep. from zero to non-zero with the purchasing consumer bias. Indeed. Thank you guys for the time. I, I really appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Hopefully the listeners got something out of it, but. I appreciate the invite. Yeah, it's been great having you. Um, we've learned a ton about uh, uh, the distributed messaging systems and, and the the great, excellent work you're doing uh, um, with uh, with Nats. Like, I definitely want to go try it now. I'm used to the other some of the other ones we've mentioned earlier, and I'm sure some of our uh, listeners are definitely going to be trying it out as well. So it sounds very, very cool. Thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, before we wrap up, I do want to mention uh, um, that uh, for those of you who are supposed to go to conferences or, or speak at conferences, meet with friends at conferences, and obviously the state of the world right now prevents that. We have a lot of our conferences sort of uh, moving online uh, and virtual, which is, which is great because it still allows us to sort of uh, maintain a, a tight-knit community. I believe that the, that might be the very next conference coming up, the uh, Go Get Community, gogetcommunity.com uh, is sort of uh, where you're going to want to go check out um, sort of the next uh, virtual conference coming up. And uh, Matt is, is, is going to MC as well, along with uh, Mark Bates. And uh, yours truly is going to play a, a small part, a small role in there. So, uh, yeah, definitely check that out. And, uh, yeah, if you have uh, uh, suggestions for the show, uh, if you have uh, your own unpopular opinions you want to throw at us, that's fine. We'll take them all in strides and try to keep coming up with, uh, with great show topics for you. Uh, again, Derek, thank you so much for, for being on the show. So long, everybody. Have a good one. Thank you for listening to the show. We appreciate your time and your attention. If Go Time has helped you be a better gopher, please do tell your friends. Word of mouth is the number one way people hear about podcasts, so we appreciate every shout-out, every tweet, every mention on Slack, Reddit, Hacker News, all of it. You know what else is cool? Responses and feedback to things said on the show. Write it down, record a response on your podcast, turn it into a conference talk, and if you do, make sure we know about it so we can help amplify. This episode was hosted by Johnny Borsico, John Calhoun, and Matt Ryer. It was produced by Jared Santo, that's me, And our music is brought to you by the one and only Breakmaster Cylinder. Special thanks to Fastly, Linode, and Rollbar. That's all for now. Denise, you next week.
if you guys get two minutes, I'll give you one last story before I pop off it. It's exactly to that, which is we were doing TIPCO. So we had all of the large financial institutions, every single one, Goldman, Lehman, you know, everybody. And we were partnered with Sun. So you always have to run our software on Sun in the financial article. And the CEO came into me one day. So I'm in Palo Alto and he's got a suit. Um, and he walks in and he hands me the suit and I go. We are live just so you know. That's fine. Okay. I, just, I, don't, <laughs> I don't want something that shouldn't be live going out. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, and so I said, what's this for? And he goes, you have to fly to uh, New York. There, there's a problem. And so I fly to New York and I come into unknown large financial institution and they go, your software sucks. And I go, mm-hmm. okay, how is that? And they said, well, and I can probably say this now since it's a uh, non-existent uh, formal company. Um, they go, we bought this, you know, million, multi-million dollar sunbox and we run your stuff on it and it's just, it's terrible. And mm-hmm. uh, they can run faster on a desktop box or whatever type of stuff. So I sat in the room and they were really not happy. They didn't like it that they had to wait six hours for me to arrive, but that's how fast planes travel. <laughs> and so I'm literally having people coming into this, this old school um, server room, freezing cold, you know, you're sitting in there typing or whatever with CDs and stuff. And it took me probably four hours to figure out what was going on. And it wasn't us, but that never helps anyone usually. So the person came in, I said, it's not us. And they said, yeah, it is you, it's your software sucks. And I go, it's not us. I said, it's the operating system. And they said, no way, right? Mm-hmm. So, long story short, the CEO of that company called the CEO of Sun and said, hey, I need someone here in six hours. So I get to sit around for six hours. They said, you can't leave. So I couldn't leave. <laughs> I got to go to the bathroom, that was it. And this person comes in and just unloads on me, right? Same thing probably happened to him. They walk in with a suit, here, put the suit on, go to the airport type stuff. And I said, I promise it's you, and, and, uh, or, or the colonel, sorry, not you. Blame the problem, not the person. And he was yelling at me and yelling at me. So in that six hours, I had to wait for him to show up. I wrote a program. And all the program did was it said, hey, find out where the interrupt handler is. And then on every other core, run a busy loop, meaning you you totally take out all the other cores. Mm. So our software is running. It was running really bad. And I said, watch this. And I go, click. And all of a sudden, our rates went up. Not big, but I mean, they went up pretty good, right? And he's like, oh, and I said, and I control seed my app. And then, of course, it went back. He goes, what did you do? I said, I just paid all 20 CPUs except for, or however, I can't remember how many they had. They had a lot. Mm-hmm. It was the, the most expensive sunbox you could buy. So long story short, they had this weird thing where they were affinitizing network interrupts on and, and scheduling us on the same thing. So we were just sitting there waiting for each other nonstop all the time. But once yeah. you did that, the OS was like, crap, I can't do that. You got to move him somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And we had a good laugh at the end, but it was a tense 12 to 14 hours. And so I remember that and, and said, hey, even if it's not your problem, show up, own it like it is your problem. Mm. And when it's not your problem, remember it could have been. So be nice. Right. <laughs> mm. yeah. That's a good that's lesson. Great. Yep. Indeed. Yeah, that's great. It's just a shame that one wasn't in the show. I know. Yeah, that would have been a good one. Maybe we can splice it back in.